So this is just looking at everything we just talked about, and it's in a different picture. So, so just pay attention, this is external respiration, and this is internal respiration. And then during external respiration, you notice this side is the alveolar space, and then this side is the blood inside of a pulmonary capillary. Okay. So during external respiration, what do we do with carbon dioxide? Do we add it to our blood or do we take it out? We take it out. So during expiration, what should be happening is the carbon dioxide should be vacating our blood, passing through the capillary wall into the alveolar space. So the amount of carbon dioxide in your lungs goes up, but the amount of blood, the carbon dioxide in blood goes down. So the, is the blood becoming more acidic or basic? these two equations. <laughs> so where where errors are going from hydrogen ions to bicarbonate to carbonic acid to water to oxygen or carbon dioxide to the oxygen. Carbon dioxide is going away. So that is this one, right? So the blood is becoming more basic. As the blood becomes more basic, I can add more oxygen. Now the other reason that that's true is that we carry part of our carbon dioxide attached to a human okay. So what we want to do is we want to take oxygen and attach it to hemoglobin. But if we have carbon dioxide bound to hemoglobin, then we can't put oxygen on it, right? So all we want to do is get rid of the carbon dioxide so we can replace it with oxygen. So What's going on is that about 25% of the carbon dioxide you carry actually attaches to hemoglobin. So it's called carbonyl hemoglobin. So what we need to do is get rid of the carbon dioxide so that we can free up that hemoglobin. And that greatly increases our O2 carrying capacity of our blood, along with the shift in pH that we make. All right, so that's kind of cool. So in internal respiration, are we wanting to attach oxygen to hemoglobin or free it up from hemoglobin? So an internal respiration. So what are we wanting to do with oxygen? I've changed it from the carbon dioxide. So do you want at, in internal respiration you want to oxygenate your tissues? You want to supply oxygen to mitochondria. So you want the oxygen to come off of you. Because oxygen bound to hemoglobin doesn't help your mitochondria. So all we want to do is we want to dissociate it from hemoglobin, right? Alright. So what we want to do up there is we want the oxygen to vacate our red blood cells and go out into our tissues. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add carbon dioxide to our blood. Because then we'll start place, displacing the oxygen from hemoglobin and carbon dioxide will bind with hemoglobin. And that displaces the oxygen off of it. Plus we get that shift in pH metabolism. So it's really kind of cool. So there's another thing that is going to impact us in a little bit. And that is, remember we said that we really don't like a very big shift in our blood pH. And what we really like to do is maintain our blood pH at about 7.4. So the way biologically we can control pH is to deal with buffers, right? We can use a buffer system. And this is a very critical buffer for us. The bicarbonate buffer is a very, very critical buffer for us. Right? So one of the buffers that's very important to us is bicarbonate. The other buffer that's important to us is actually hemoglobin. Okay? So, 
what happens is, and maybe we can see it up here first, I think. So what happens if you look at that line of equation up there is that what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to take this oxygen off of this component, and then we're going to allow that oxygen to go out to our tissues where we, we need to use it, right? And what can happen is either carbon dioxide can bind with that hemoglobin or hydrogen ions can bind with it. And so if something takes hydrogen ions out of solution, it is a buffer. So, so um, hemoglobin is, a, is, a, is an important buffer that helps us kind of maintain the blood pH that we want to maintain. But to do that, it has to be free of oxygen. So, so we're going to carry about seven percent dissolved. That's just carbon dioxide, just like it's in a Pepsi container. We're going to add twenty-five percent to hemoglobin. Seventy-five percent we're going to carry as that buffer. That's important to us to buy carbon. So what we do in our tissues actually really helps maintain blood pH in our bodies. Because we free oxygen off of hemoglobin, it will attract hydrogen ions, and we make bicarbonate, which are both very important to that process. So that kind of leads to what we call the Haldane effect, which is the lower the oxyhemoglobin, the higher the O2 carrying capacity of the blood. So all we're saying is, the more oxygen I give off my hemoglobin in my tissues, the more carbon dioxide I can attach to that hemoglobin. Then also the the deoxyhemoglobin acts as a buffer that we just talked. Kind of two principles with that. Okay, so we're going to actually cover this in the lab on Tuesday. It's just how we control our respiratory system. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to kind of leave that alone. And so I want to just go to a couple of this set of clinical terms, then we'll go on to lecture three. So out of that last conversation, carbon dioxide levels in your blood become important because they they help you carry oxygen, but they also help you change blood pH. And the bicarbonate becomes critical because it's a buffer. Right? So we do not ever want to completely get all the carbon dioxide out of the blood. Because if we do that, we will not be able to oxygenate ourselves as well, and we will not be able to control blood pH. Right? So even though ideally we don't want an abundance of carbon dioxide in our we never want to totally get rid of all the carbon dioxide in the blood. So intuitively, you probably know that if you've had first aid, because if somebody has a panic attack and they're hyperventilating, what are you supposed to do? But a paper bag, not a plastic bag. <laughs> Put a paper bag over their face, right? Why? Did you ever want to look? Because it, it builds up CO2 because while they're hyperventilating, they're losing too much of CO2. And that's changing their blood pH. And that's the we, then they can't oxygen themselves. So what you do is you try to control their carbon dioxide in their blood by putting that bag in their face. And trying to get, because what you're doing inside the bag, carbon dioxide's going up, so while they're breathing, they're losing less carbon dioxide out of their blood. So you're controlling loss of carbon dioxide out of their blood is what you're doing. So, so we have two terms for that. And so hypercapnia and hypocapnia deals with the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in blood. So the ideal, the ideal state is between 40 and 45 for partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And so if we drop below 40, then we're in a state of hypocapnia. And technically, if we go, go above 40, we're in a state of hypercapnia, but really our critical value is 45 for, for hypercapnia. All right. So 
if we think about that in terms of pulmonary ventilation, then we think of a standard respiratory rate. So if your respiratory rate is way too high, then we say you're hyperventilating. And if your respiratory rate is really low, like somebody in shock, then you are hypoventilating. So the problem with hyperventilation and hypoventilation is it changes the blood levels of carbon dioxide. And it, it puts you in either a state of hypercapnia or hypocapnia, right? So let's see if we can reason that one out. So in which instance, hypoventilation or hyperventilation, would you be losing too much carbon dioxide too quickly? Hyperventilation. So then is hyperventilation going to put you in a state of hypocapnia or hypercapnia? Hypocapnia. So what we do at the bag is to prevent you from entering a state of hypocapnia. It just worry about that. Okay. For now. Um, so actually, when somebody's hyperventilating, they're breathing deeper. Than so they aren't, they aren't quite, their respiration rate is, is high, but they're actually exchanging more air for the time. So if you just watch their chest, you know, and somebody is breathing quietly, you can barely see their chest moving. Usually somebody's hyperventilating. Yeah, so they're actually deep, they're breathing deeper than normal. All right. All right. So wasn't that cool? So if you hyperventilate, you enter hyper or hypocapnia? Hypocapnia. So they just connect inversely. So hyperventilation leads to hypocapnia. Then the inverse hypoventilation would lead to hypercapnia. Very good. All right. And then the other way we can look at it is oxygen. And we can look at oxygen supply to tissues. So if you have tissues that are starving for oxygen, because you're trying to get out of Lake Coeur d'Alene because you thought it would be a good idea to do the, the uh, swim in the middle of winter time and you're not too happy right now, then your brain would eventually become hypoxic. As your brain becomes hypoxic, that's what we see in people that are, that are, in, that are actually moving into more serious hypoventilation is they act like they're drunk when the brain, they get confused and they can't answer questions and stuff because their brain's starting for oxygen because it leads them to hypercapnia. Now, if you didn't have any oxygen at all, then we'd say anoxic, A-N in front of it. But that leads to instant death. So when you grow apples, this is kind of an interesting thing. So when you grow apples like in Yakima, and you want to store them so that you can have apples in the store all year round. Oxygen makes apples age and, and ripen. So all those big orchards over in the Tri-Cities, Yakima, and Wenatchee have these big storage buildings where they, the atmosphere in there is nitrogen and not oxygen. They remove all the oxygen out uh, of the atmosphere. And if you were to open the door and walk in, four minutes later, you'd be dead. So they have all these warning signs on it all the time about that. Because there's no oxygen in that environment at all. All right, so, so hypoxic events, you could survive. Anoxic events, you, you could not survive. All right. So how do we get to hypoxic events? And there's, there's four kind of primary reasons. So hypoxic hypoxia is what we would see in somebody climbing Everest. It's what you would encounter if you were in that plane at 35,000 feet and you don't put your air mask on. Uh, where there's just no oxygen. Or you have an obstructed airway. So somebody who's, who's out eating and they start going, then they're going to quickly enter hypoxic hypoxia, which leads to their death if you don't do something. 
about it. Right? So my wife was interviewing for a job right out of residency. And the woman who's interviewing her starts doing this. So my wife was like, is this just a test or <laughs> And she says, are you really jumping to that? And she said, I couldn't talk. So she had to do the final maneuver in the interview. Yeah, she was out there. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like kind of weird. So another reason would be anemic hypoxia. So anemia is a deficiency of hemoglobin. So if you don't make enough hemoglobin, you can't carry enough oxygen. So that's another thing you would see clinically is you could have a patient who's just chronically tired. And if you do a blood test, and they're anemic. Voila. They're chronically tired because they do not have enough oxygen on board. Yeah. Right. So we would see this particularly in concern in elderly people, uh, anemic hypoxia and in uh, cancer treatment, where you're doing chemotherapy because you start making red blood cells. And then patients become really, uh, they become really anemic and, and sometimes have to have transfusions to, to maintain oxygen levels. And then ischemic hypoxia. So anytime we use the word ischemia, it's a decrease in blood flow to a tissue. So, Ischemic hypoxia occurs because you get a decrease in blood flow to your brain, for example. It would make you very uh, tired as well. So you can see that in elderly people as well, depending on how quickly it sets up. But because of the way the carotid goes through the carotid canal, it bends, then we tend to put plaque in our carotid. And as the plaque begins to occlude the carotid, then there's less oxygen to the brain. But that's due to ischemia. So then some elderly people are, well, we would, somebody who has an occluded uh, carotid would begin to have dysfunction of the brain. So we would say they have ischemic dementia because their brain isn't working as well because they don't have enough oxygen to, to supply. And then heart attack patients whose heart is going well are in ischemic hypoxia because of the tongue. The heart is in one. Then we have histotoxic hypoxia as well. So histotoxic refers to tissues, histotoxic to tissues. So that's agents that, that block O2 use. So the most common thing you could encounter would be cyanide, uh, prevents your, your tissues from using O2. So we used to put people to death in gas chambers by exposing them to cyanide. And they would die from it. Histotoxic hypoxia. There's actually a guy trying to kill his wife. I saw this on, on one of those shows on that time. You never know if it's true or not. And so he'd been adding cyanide to his wife's food. And then she got sick and she was like, what's going on? They've been having this little fight. In the so, so she quit eating the food he'd give her. So then he tried to figure out how to add cyanide to her body. So then she would, and she wouldn't drink anything he gave her. So then he started adding cyanide to the outside of the condom and they had sex. She was still having sex with him? That's <laughs> <laughs> the mood would be kind of weird. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, what they say sometimes is the best sense is after fights. <laughs> Who knows? I'm glad I recorded all that. <laughs> all right. So, lecture three allows us to think about a bunch of things that we've been thinking about with the respiratory system and the urinary system kind of separately at first with the urinary system, and then combining the activities of the respiratory and urinary, urinary system together. So one of the things we said that the urinary system does is help us maintain blood volume. And if we can maintain blood volume, we can maintain blood pressure. All right. So when we look at the human body, we're, we're actually a bag of water, essentially. 
So if you're female, 55% of your body mass is water. If, if you're male, about 60% 60 of your water biomass is water. So, so we're essentially a bag of water, men are more water than women. Okay. And so what we do then is what we're really concerned about from a physiological standpoint is where we're putting this water. And so in normal physiology, about two-thirds of this water is inside your cells, and a third of it is extracellular water. Then all we do is we take extracellular water and we divide it into the water within our blood, blood plasma, and in the water between tissues, interstitial fluid. Okay. And so for us to be healthy, we want to, we want to maintain this relationship. And we don't want to put more water in our blood, and we don't want to put more water in our cells. Because our cells are either going to swell first or shrivel up, and then our blood pressure is going to go way up if we do that. So when we're looking at what the kidney does in urine formation, it's really trying to maintain this balance between intracellular and extracellular fluids and the relationship between blood plasma and interstitial fluids. So that's really the, the big picture that we're looking at. So the other thing we said that the, the kidney was did is it helped maintain electrolyte balance or ion balance in the blood. Okay. So if we look at the major ions that we've talked about historically, sodium for depolarization, potassium for repolarization, calcium for synaptic communication of neurons, then what we see is that sodium is an extracellular fluid electrolyte in blood plasma and interstitial fluid. And we don't maintain much potassium in that arena. Whereas potassium is mostly intracellular and we don't maintain very much in, in our blood. And calcium is mostly extracellular with a higher amount in our blood and less within our uh, interstitial fluid and very little within cells. But remember that even though uh, osteocytes and osteoblasts take up calcium, they don't maintain it. They put it outside the, themselves in the matrix of bone, right? So even though you might think, well, well, wait a minute, bone cells take up all this calcium. They don't keep it inside themselves. They precipitate it out in bone matrix, right? And then if we look at magnesium, it's usually a coenzyme, so it's usually found within cells or enzymes. Yeah. So now if we look at negative ions, sodium and chloride always like to hang around together. That makes sense. The bicarbonate we were just talking about is formed in blood with the interaction of carbon dioxide. So we actually keep more bicarbonate in our extracellular component than inside of our blood. And so this becomes our important buffer in our extracellular component. This is a very important buffer, but it's inside of our cells. So we actually have a different buffer inside our cells than outside of our cells. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then the only other one would be proteins where we typically keep our proteins either in our blood or in our cells and not in our interstitial fluid. So BCOP that we talked about is over here and then inside cells is different. So we just have a pattern of what we, we talked about. So what we want to do is we want to kind of look at, at how we balance water and in what problems occur that the digestive that the urinary system has to compensate. So we have, we have water gained primarily from ingestion of liquids. So you're supposed to drink a given amount of water per day, and you get some from very liquid foods. And we get some from food in general. And we metabolically make water through the electron transport system. Right? So our, our water gain per day is because we're making ATP and because we're ingesting it. Our water loss is through our lungs because every time we breathe out, our air is moist. So in the winter time when it's cold, you create that little fog out of your mouth because you got warm, moist air vacating your lungs. We lose water through perspiration to try to maintain body temperature. And then we, on the average, we produce a liter and a half of urine per day. So, so 
so we lose most of it in our kidneys. And so what we're going to see is that our kidneys make sense of where we can make the biggest change in that water loss, is because that's our, our bigger, biggest water loss phenomenon. So what happens if you're dehydrated? Blood volume would be up or down? Be down. And then blood pressure would be up or down? Down. Then we have that wonderful relationship we talked about. Where so, so remember the other day when we were doing this, what, what our relationship was if if blood volume goes down, then blood pressure goes down. Then initially GFR would go down, and then urine output initially would go would initially go down, right? Then the inverse is true if blood volume goes up, then blood pressure goes up, and then initially GFR would go up, and urine output would go up, right? And then what we talked about was the auto-regulation mechanisms that help us regulate that. So that's why it's important that at this point we say GFR initially goes up. And then we want to go back to homeostasis, right? All right. So if we're dehydrated, then do we want to, then initially, Blood volume would, is down because we're dehydrated. Blood pressure would go down, GFR would go down. So, but we want to maintain homeostasis, right? So what do we want to do with GFR if we can? We want to increase it, all right? So what would happen if you get dehydrated is your blood volume goes down, your blood pressure goes down, that's over here. Your blood osmolarity would do what? And blood osmolarity is V, basically. So BCOP really is uh, proteins that are solutes in your blood over the plasma of your blood. So if we think of that in terms of osmotic pressure, so blood osmolarity, is the blood becoming more hypertonic or hypotonic? So, if, if, so what's going on? In this instance, we're increasing blood osmolarity, so we're increasing this relationship. So then the blood is becoming hypertonic, right? And then if the blood is hypertonic, then is it going to take on water or it's going to take on water? Yeah. So if the blood is hypertonic, then we're going to move water into it from the area that's hypotonic. Now it would be your cells. So long term what happens with dehydration is you, you begin to dehydrate your cells, yes. Right. So we have this increase in osmolarity. And then we also typically decrease our saliva production so we have dry mouth and dry things. And then in normal physiology, when your mouth gets dry, your hypothalamus tells you to drink. <laughs> And then we also have some osmoreceptors that we're going to talk about in the hypothalamus eventually. And what they do is they look at the, how, what BCOP really is, essentially. And what they do then is trigger you to breathe. Okay. Now what the kidney does is the kidney would have a decrease in urine flow initially over the macula densa, and then the juxtaglomerular cells would release renin, and renin would convert angiostensinogen to angiostensin 1, which goes to the lungs where ACE converts it to angiostensin 2. So ultimately, what you're going to get is an increase in formation of angiostensin 2, and then that would affect your thirst. 
So without even doing much else, what you what you have is three ways in which you're going to increase your thirst centers, you're going to increase your water intake, and hopefully bring your body back to homeostasis. And then the other thing angiostensin will do if we wanted to add detail to this is remember as as A2 goes up, ADH goes up or down. Uh, and aldosterone goes up, right? So not only do you increase your thirst, but you also decrease, increase your reabsorption of water through your kidneys. So ADH and, and aldosterone all increase O2 reabsorption. Right? Why would you want to do that? Because your blood volume's down. So if your blood volume's down, you want to pee more or pee less? Pee less. And the way you pee less is you reabsorb more of the fluid. Okay. Very cool. I think that's what the next slide really is. No. Following this. All right, so this is kind of an interesting scenario. And it's looking at electrolytes. So if you start at the top, you, all of these assume that we're, we're moving out of homeostasis. So the mechanism is increased intake in sodium chloride. So you, for some reason, have lately had this craving for salt. And potato chips aren't salty enough, so you salt your potato chips. Or in a real situation, my wife had an elderly woman who had lost her husband. She'd been in her patient for 20 years for as long as she'd been in Spokane. So she knew the patient really well. And after her husband lost, she noticed that the woman's cognitive ability was just changed by like that. So she said, like, what's going on? And, you know, did some blood tests, and her blood sodium was just really high. So then she comes back and says, OK. And we said, what are you, what are you change? And what had gone on is she'd always cooked because her, she cooked for her husband, not really for herself. And her husband died, and she didn't want to cook anymore, so she just started eating chemical soup. Lot, not low sodium counts. And put her in a state where her, her sodium levels had skyrocketed, which was then having an impact on her. So, what was the impact? Well, you get increased plasma concentrations of sodium chloride. So, here we were increasing the solute concentration actually because we were decreasing plasma because we had a decrease in blood volume. In this instance up here, we're adding the sodium to this. To the blood. So we have, what we get is an increase in solutes over the plasma in a different way. Okay, does that make sense? Because as soon as you take the salt in, you absorb it through your gut lining. The first place it goes is your blood. And then where are we going to maintain it? In that first graph, we maintain it in our extracellular fluids, not inside of our cells. So what you do is you get an increase in osmosis of water from the intracellular fluid into interstitial fluid. So in essence, what we did again is we now have made this inside of our blood hypertonic, and then over here, our cells are hypotonic, so the water's gonna move from here to here and here to here, okay? Because we increase the blood osmolarity. So then we get an increase in blood volume. So if we get an increase in blood volume, then what's going to happen to blood pressure? It's going to increase. And then what would happen normally to GFR? It's going to increase. And what would normally happen to urine output? It's going to increase, right? So we get this increase in blood volume. So the question is, is the increase in GFR adequate to take care of the increase in blood volume that's occurring. So in this instance, it wasn't. So we keep getting an increase in blood volume, and we're getting an increase in blood pressure. And what happens is we start stretching the walls of the atrial heart because our volume is increasing. So blood coming to the heart is going up. So our heart is being stretched. Well, overstretching the heart doesn't sound like 
no overstretching anything is never good. So what we're going to do is this overstretching of the heart is going to cause the release of A and P. And an A and P makes you pee more or pee less? More. Yeah. So these increase the reabsorption of water. A and P, if we get an, if we get an increase in A and P, it has the opposite effect. It decreases O2 reabsorption. Okay? So it makes you pee more. So in essence, A and P and ADH are antagonistic hormones. They have opposite effect. So we're going to re we're going to re reduce the reabsorption of water and sodium chloride by the kidney. So we're actually going to increase our urine loss of water and sodium, and we're going to bring our blood back to blood volume back to normal, and then I'll bring our blood pressure back to normal, and we'll be in a happy state, right? Then the other thing is, if you get an increase in blood volume and you get an increase in GFR. Then you got an increase in fluid flow over the macula densa. So now you'll stop making renin. If you stop making renin, then you're, eventually your blood levels of angiostensin 2 will go down. And if your blood levels of angiostensin 2 drop, then you will increase your glomerular filtration rate and it will decrease the aldosterone, which will decrease the reabsorption of sodium. And it'll help you get rid of all that stuff. As well. Okay, so <coughs> so this one is similar to the last one, except it's at a grander scale. So what would happen if you had excessive blood loss? So you have a bad hemorrhage. You had excessive sweating because you're in Phoenix and it's 120 and you don't have air conditioning. And actually, uh, I think it was two summers ago where Phoenix had a, a heat wave where it was in excess of 115 for, for about four, four weeks in the summer. And there were over 35 or 40 people that were kind of sleeping that all died. That this is kind of why they die. Or you're having copious amounts of diarrhea because you're in Haiti and you have cholera from the water that's contaminated. So, and then the only thing you can do is drink more water. You can't go to the store and buy PDO or Gator. So you got all this water loss and you, you're only replacing it with water. So the key is what's gone are what's in Gatorade, Pura, Pedialyte, and so forth. The electrolytes. Right? So then we get a decrease in sodium concentration, right, in our interstitial fluid and blood plasma. Then we'd say this, the person is entering a state of hyponutremia. So what's going on now is our solutes are changing, right? So now they're not increasing, they're decreasing. So if they're decreasing in our blood, then our blood is not hypertonic anymore, it's hypotonic. And our cell is now hypertonic. So now what direction is water going to move? Into the cell. And what are those cells going to do? They're going to swell and swell and swell. So what happens when neurons in your brain swell? It leads you to coma and possible death. That is exactly what happened to the guy I told you about the other day, five gallons of water to win a, to win a, a computer game in California, dying. She died. She technically died from what we would say is water intoxication. Because she essentially diluted her blood so much, the blood became hypertonic that the kidney couldn't keep up with it. Because in the kidney, 
you got this blood volume increase, you got this blood pressure increase, you got GFR increasing, but it couldn't keep up with it. So all the water entered the cells, the cells started swelling and swelling and swelling and rupturing. She actually complained of a severe, severe headache before she left the, uh, the contest. So that was a really strange thing. All right, so just to reiterate everything we've kind of talked about, is the nephron is what allows us to reabsorb water. So most of the water is reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule, right? So this part is critically important. The next amount of water is in this countercurrent system because of the thin parts of the loop of Henle, right? And then in the distal convoluted tubule blocking duct, we change from obligatory water movement to facultative water movement because it's under the control of hormones in our principal cells. And then our, our major hormone that's the biggest player is ADH, right? So ADH makes you pee more or pee less. Pee less. So then ADH, you would want an increase in DA, ADH if you're dehydrated or over. You're dehydrated, okay. right? Good. So high blood osmotic pressure, low blood osmotic pressure. That's taking that idea of dehydration and making you think about this. So if I have high blood osmotic pressure, it's because my solutes are going up and my plasma is going down. So I would have high blood osmotic pressure if I was dehydrated or over. Plasma going down, dehydrated, right? So if I'm dehydrated, do I want to pee more or pee less? Pee less. So do I want ADH or AMP release? ADH, voila, there it is. So we have high blood osmotic pressure because we're dehydrated. We want to increase our, our ADH so we can retain more water in our kidneys. We want to shut our sweat glands down. Which is, by the way, when, you, you know, you're, when you're in a real hot environment, you don't have good water to drink, adequate water supply to drink. What eventually happens is you get dehydrated, and as you get dehydrated, your body says, I'm sorry, you can't sweat anymore. Well, that's how you were cooling yourself. And so now you can't sweat anymore, and now you can't cool yourself. And that's not a good place to be. Some people die from heat and plastic because of it. And then, we constrict our, our, we constrict our, uh, our blood vessels to our hands and feet to try to keep core circulation down. So a person who, this is the, the weirdest thing about it, a person who is in trouble because they're overheated, their hands will actually be cold and clammy. Because they, they, as they get more and more dehydrated, they have to stop blood flow to the extremities to maintain core circulation. That's the weirdest thing. You'd think they would be like, they would be like over sweating and have all this perspiration going, but they can't. They can't anymore. So they aren't sweating. So you would think it'd be just pouring off their face, but it isn't. And then they go kind of white. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm really in trouble here. All right. So this is just a reminder of our buddy Renan. So it is produced by the testicular cells of the kidney. Renin interacts with angiostensin that was produced by the liver. It converts it to angiostensin 1, which takes a trip to the lungs where ACE converts it to angiostensin 2. Why would you do that? Angiostensin 2 is a hormone of dehydration. So why would we do it? Because we get a decrease in blood volume, we get a decrease in blood pressure. Then angiostensin II increases the release of aldosterone, increases the release of ADH, and all of those help you recover water. Isn't that cool?
So these are just some flow charts that just do exactly what we've just been talking about, just to give you a think about. It. So it's always the homeostasis of where we want to be. Why are we no longer in homeostasis? Because we've got an increase in extracellular fluid volume. So plasma is extracellular fluid, right? So blood volume is going up. So blood pressure would be going up. And GFR would go up and your outward would go up. The question is, is how fast is blood volume changing? And if it's changing too fast, your kidney can't keep up on its normal. So what happens is, as blood volume goes up, we begin to stretch the heart. As we stretch the heart, the heart makes A and P. A and P makes it be more or P less. So the way to think about that is A, D, P, A, A, D, H has no P in it. A and P has a P in it, so it's going to make you P more. There you go. All right. So what we want to do, because we have too much blood volume, is we want to get rid of some. So how do we want to do it? We want to stop drinking as much. We want ADH to be decreased so that we make more urine. And so we want to urinate more, right? And if you pee that blood out, then you go back to normal blood volume. 